and they um, just want coverage for major illness and or injury. And this is, of course, uh, I'll get to it later, keep in mind that like a lot of preventative stuff is covered already by the government in my perfect world. Um, a lot of screenings and things like that are covered. So these are just, if they just want major illness or major injury. So very, very high deductibles, but low premiums. The next one is regular. Um, so this would be low premiums, mid-range deductibles. This is kind of, um, what Americans see is their like normal kind of health insurance. So preventative care, um, of course, would be covered in there. Routine care, pre-existing conditions would be covered, illness, um, and then basic dental, vision, and prescriptions, which I'll get more in detail about in a little bit. Premium, this is the fancy insurance. So um, highest premiums, low deductibles, normal plus total dental, total vision, um, and prescriptions would be included in that, and then you also get the catastrophic. So it's kind of like a combination of all of them. Of course, this would be the highest price, but people could choose to pay that. And that we've seen that in other countries where they have the tiered system. And then Medicaid, of course, income based. Um, we would incentivize states to expand it, make enrollment much easier. Um, again, just talking from my own experience, um, and luckily this experience is positive with. Um, Kentucky, but having enrolled so many immigrant communities in Connect, like it was fairly easy to use and it was pretty straightforward. Um, one thing I really liked about it is that you didn't have to go to like the Division of Community Based Services, like where uh, Food Stamps are and where like TANF, KCAP, like the welfare program is. Um, you didn't have to go into that office because different offices were able to authorize like con they're called connectors and so you could just go like connect your refugee ministries we had two different ones and people would just go and meet with them instead of appointments and so it was really really easy to enroll people and i wish that had been nationwide um this is for low-income people families and children and individuals with disabilities who so you have medicaid and of course medicare um they could choose between normal and premium income base for seniors um and then individuals that are 55 plus can buy into this. Again, this is just my perfect world. Um, details, so more government subsidies for high income tax on the rich. Obviously this would not go over well if I was president, but um, I'm a firm believer in that if you make a lot, you should share a lot of it. Um, regions would oversee the payments and use of government subsidies so this is just another way that admin costs would be down because it would be regional um, and not so much state driven so they would maybe have like a headquarters in one of the states or something but for the whole region um, higher penalties for failure to enroll this would ensure that everyone is on um, has insurance uh, kind of like Danielle touched on a smart card because I think from various nations we've seen that this has um, a great effect not only on admin spending but also on just people having access to their own information and being able to go from doctor to doctor if they need to and the doctor has everything um, I'm sure if you're American <clears throat> you've been in a situation where or, um, from the US um, if you've been in a situation where you go to a new doctor and they don't know anything I know I've been um, in that situation a lot where I choose a different chiropractor and they're like well let's start over x-rays let's do this and it's like well, my doctor's not, you know, my old chiropractor isn't a provider network anymore. So it's just really frustrating. And I think that would eliminate a lot of it, especially with the technology we have available today. Um, immigrants can buy insurance plans regardless of status. This was something Hillary really campaigned on and something I strongly believe um, because if they're not able to buy insurance, <coughs> Uh, people are going to get sick anyway, so someone's going to end up paying for that. Uh, people are still going to go to emergency rooms and be treated. People are still going to have to access some kind of health care. So they're going to have to be treated, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind, even though that will that can always be very controversial. Um, however, Medicaid would require identification and documentation, um, but they could buy their own plan if they're undocumented. Um, for refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, people under DACA could receive Medicaid. Um, human trafficking victims and victims of sexual assault, I think they should also receive VOCA subsidies. So VOCA um, is the Victims of Crime Act, and basically any um, 
federally convicted felons, their fines, and this is like a program that's in America right now, their fines, um, bail, bond, all that goes into this big fund, and then that fund is used to um, fund a lot of the like sexual um, violence programming, rape crisis centers, domestic violence centers. I know that sounds too good to be true in America, but it's something really smart that we're doing. And I think part of that money should also be used to subsidize, uh, subsidize their healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, hospital admin, healthcare professionals, and consumer advocates would set rates and negotiate prices with insurance providers in a perfect world, and they would accept those rates, and everyone would be really happy with how much it's going to cost. Um, so I think um, something that is a huge issue is drug advertising in America. Um, I know a lot of my friends that come to America look at our magazines, look at our commercials, and they're like, you can just have an advertisement for a prescription medication? Like, that's crazy. Um, it confuses Americans, first and foremost. It requires, I mean, it definitely, I, I know personally, I, I'll look at a magazine, like, maybe I do have that. Maybe I do need that medication. Whereas, like, it's completely undiagnosed, but it's like, well, it's in Cosmos, so maybe they're telling the truth. Um, just kidding. But, um, <laughs> So I think that should absolutely be banned or at least really, really heavily regulated. And their market research departments are huge. Uh, they're spending so much money on marketing, um, so much money on just advertising and putting in magazines, putting on commercials, making the fans as commercial possible, that I think a lot of that money could be used um, for research funding and eliminating that would make prescription medication go down because you're not paying for them. I mean, when you're paying for prescription medication, you're paying for them to also market to other people which I think is crazy. Um, oh, I don't have um, Heavy regulations are pharmaceutical lobbying. Um, I think lobbying, of course, is a huge issue in America. Um, from <coughs> pharmaceutical uh, companies to also like the dairy industry, the meat industry. I mean, um, of course, you see in the news a lot, even like NRA, um, they have a really, really tight grip on these politicians. And it's really, really hard to believe that politicians have your best interests in mind when they're receiving all this money from pharmaceutical companies. Um, so that is really something that we need to have regulated in America. Um, lowering prescription costs, this is also kind of controversial. Um, my very favorite senator, Cory Booker from New Jersey, just got in trouble for talking about this a few months ago. He does follow me on Twitter though, so um, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but uh, import prescription drugs from abroad with FDA, oh, that's supposed to say import, I'm sorry. Import prescription drugs from abroad with FDA approval and regulation. I think this would drive down the cost. Um, it would also prioritize um, just global cross-cultural you know, teamwork and working together because a lot of countries have really great access to prescription medication. We as Americans aren't getting some of that new medicine. It takes a long time. I think we should double the funding for community health centers in a perfect world. Um, that focus on preventative care. I, Obama was really clear that he wanted to triple the size of the National Health Service Corps, and I think that should be tripled and it should provide in-home visits for chronic health management and health screenings like we see in a lot of other countries that people discussed in their um, presentations. And then, so, district should prioritize hands-like program for all pregnant women, and we'll talk about baby boxes too, but um, hands, it's a really interesting program. It's another thing one of the few things Kentucky Supreme Court um, the tagline for it is like every parent needs another set of hands. So basically what happens, Kentucky used the tobacco settlement money that they receive every year from the tobacco companies. Um, and every woman who's on Medicaid um, or just like meets a certain set of requirements, like maybe has something in her history um, or just something's going on with her stress or some kind of like red flag. Um, she receives a social worker and a nurse from the time she's pregnant until the child is two. They do weekly home visits, um, the social worker does, and the nurse does monthly home visits. And they basically teach parents how to parent. And that is um, teaching how to set bedtimes, what food should they, whatever foods they should be eating, why tummy time is important, and the muscles that it builds. They build craft with the, uh, they make crafts with the moms and just kind of talk about that. And in Kentucky, we've seen a huge reduction in um, child abuse and neglect um, and a lot of preventive uh, diseases that could have been prevented in children. And it would be my dream to make that go nationwide, really globally, but we'll say it goes nationwide. And then baby boxes. Um, this is something that 
people that are from Europe might know about. They're really, I think the Finnish ones are the um, most known about, but baby boxes where if a woman is pregnant, she can go and from the government receive a box with everything she needs in it um, for the first year or so of a child's life, and she doesn't have to purchase all those diapers, she doesn't have to purchase all that formula. Um, the clothing is gender neutral, and then um, the box becomes a crib. Um, and that's one of the safe, it has a little mattress in the bottom, and that is one of the safest places for a baby to sleep. And that's something I think America should absolutely prioritize, um, because we've seen that across the board. There's a lot of issues with that, and a lot of child abuse and neglect issues. Um, and I think that's all. That is, um, yeah, just sources. So that is the end of my first book. Everyone has been there. There's a lot of healthy babies. So. Thank you. Any questions? Does everyone agree with me? Yes, yeah, I have baby business. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just about the beginning, the, the first slide, I think it was, about the 138%. There, Medicaid coverage now includes uninsured Americans under 138% of the poverty level. Can you yeah. explain that? Um, yeah, so as we kind of just, I think it was in this class that we talked about it, but where the poverty rate is the same across um, across the country. And what I understood from this is that, of course, like 100%, you may have to get more than 100%, but 38% um, is accounting for people that haven't um, either been like, documented really as like being under the poverty rate or like considered to be like, I don't, that's how I understood it, is it's like not with people that aren't, with, don't fall into that 100%, it's a little bit extra. I, I don't think I'm explaining that well, but. No, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I was gonna explain my understanding. Oh, please that. do, yeah. Um, so my understanding is it's 138% of the poverty level. So if the poverty level is, say, making $1,000 a month, 138% of that would be you make $1,400 a month. Um, so if you only make $1,400 a month, you would still apply for this, even though you're technically above the poverty level, it's still a low income amount. Yeah. Right. That's what it is. So federal poverty level is some dollar figure in the United States. And I think every country establishes some sort of poverty level. I, I don't know how that happens. WHO maybe? I don't know. And then they say this percentage of the population is in poverty. So in the United States, you have whatever that income is, let's say it's twelve thousand dollars that's the federal poverty level. 138% is going to be an income that's higher. And it's a bell-shaped curve, and as you move up this federal poverty, or move away from the federal poverty level, you get a lot of people involved. So it's a big deal. You go from 120 to 138 percent, it's going to be so many millions of people who get covered. Thank you. That, David, good question. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. All right, now, we've had two descriptions of a future U.S. healthcare system. I'd like you to depersonalize this. The first one is A, the second is B. So we're not voting for Irma and Danielle, okay? But I'm gonna ask you which you prefer and why. Can we summarize like, the differences between them? Yeah. No. Okay. What you heard. You heard it, think about it a little bit. Right? Think about it just for a minute. Think about what each of them said. Then we'll have a little vote, and then we'll talk about why, and then we'll uncover the differences. Okay, so how many people are in favor of A? You can't figure out the differences? No, it's for me too hard to say which one I Okay. I, I, yeah, I would need like a summary. Yeah. <laughs> I think right. they both did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, so let me, let me try to summarize okay. for you the differences that I heard. I'm gonna make it very simplistic, the differences. She proposes a single system. And she proposes a system that has multiple solutions. Which is more revolutionary? Single system. Single system. System A is more revolutionary. System B is more evolutionary. 
Okay? So, which is more practical and which is better? This is better. This is more practical. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I know. This is, this is better, this is but that's more practical. practical. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, now, how are we defining yes. practical? Which is more politically, which is more likely to be politically acceptable? That one is. Which is more practical? That one. Practical in the sense that you can apply it more I thought it was based on programs that are already that do already exist. Like the hands and the right? Some, yeah, yeah. Some some so she's taking the multiple systems of the US healthcare. Yes. And she's expanding them to cover everything. She is taking one existing system and expanding it to care of you. To care of you. Politically, this one is easier to sell. Mm -hmm. This is more efficient. <laughs> okay? Well, my bias comes from being a liberal in a conservative state. So I think that's just okay. how my mind works. <laughs> now, let's, two quick things and then we're going to take a break for lunch. First of all, is it worth it to even try in the United States, either of these two? Are they wasting their time? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because the system is already working. I mean, it's, it, should, it needs change. Ultimately, people need health care. Ultimately, people need health care, okay? And, as those of you who took the leadership course, remember, okay, part of your job as a leader is to advocate. If you don't advocate, nothing will happen. But you also have to be politically aware then your advocacy is not going to be what ultimately happens. It will be a compromise. Okay? So you have to advocate in something you believe and advocate strongly for it. But also, a good politician knows how to advocate and then how to compromise. Remember, somewhere along the line, in this course, I had this business where I had uh, the left and the right and laws get passed where compromise occurs. Okay? Now, so that's my first point. The second one is more detailed, but I think it's pertinent. So we'll just go over that and then we will stop the finish. This is a detail of the Affordable Care Act, and it's an example of failed politics. It's something called. individual mandate. Now, for those people who really have studied the Affordable Care Act and the U.S. health care system, they understand what this means. For those of you who are not U.S., it's not going to necessarily make sense to you. Danielle, can you explain what the individual mandate is, you know? So, everyone was required to get health care coverage for a, a penalty um, of 2.5%. Their income. Um, and a lot of people chose to pay the penalty because it was cheaper for them to buy insurance. So, so we were, yeah, we were <laughs> proposing raising that so it would be cheaper. Okay, so it. the reason I'm talking about this is one, politics, and two, insurance. So, Charlie, in, the, in Israel, is there an individual mandate? No, the 5% of the tax goes to health care and you can't buy out. Everyone has to have health care. So there is an individual oh. mandate. Everyone must have health insurance. Everyone who can afford it must contribute to it. If you're poor, you don't pay for health insurance in this room. But if you're not poor, you must. Money is taken away from you to provide for health care. Is that true in France? Yes. It's not a choice. It's, the it's not a choice. Thing. It's automatic. It's a mandate. It. Yeah. It's a mandate. Mm -hmm. So what the Obama administration proposed was a mandate that everyone have health insurance. Being that it's America, everything ends up being about money. So money and individual freedom. So they said, okay, you don't have to have it. If you refuse to have health insurance, you don't have to, but you still have to pay for it. Okay? Fine, you don't want insurance? Fine, you're going to still pay a penalty. How does that account for all those individuals with pre-existing conditions who, if they would like to purchase health insurance, can't necessarily find it? They could. 
Yeah. In the United States, could. You can't you can deny always find a policy. You can't deny based on pre-existing Right now. Right now. Right. Right. Oh, that's yeah. part of the Affordable Care Act. Before yeah. that. Okay. And but maybe in the future, change. that won't be the situation right. anymore. But that's like that. So, was the but actually, I thought what you just said was that, in fact, a lot of people chose to pay the fine because it was cheaper than the insurance. Okay. So, well, maybe they wanted it and they just couldn't yeah, afford this it. This is the politics, okay? We'll get back to the politics in a minute. Let's talk about the insurance concept. Okay. Why do you want to mandate insurance? Why do you want everyone to be covered? So you have a balanced pool that's cheaper? Of course. The so more people, people the healthy you pay the sick. The healthy you pay for the sick. The young people who don't think they need insurance coverage Those are, healthy. are healthy. They don't need it. But they have to contribute. Now, what's the social argument to say, you're young. I mean, how many of you in here need health insurance? Why? Why? Uh, you don't have to answer that person. Why would a young person, but let's make it generic, why would a young person need health insurance? In case something happens. In case something happens, catastrophic coverage. Okay. Heart palpitation. <laughs> you never know, right? Okay. So that's the reason why even young people need health insurance for the potential of catastrophic coverage. A catastrophic event, right? Catastrophic. Catastrophic. Yes. If they are already paying penalties, why wouldn't it be some kind of catastrophic insurance for these people? Because they're paying already for five right. percent. If I can make them pay, let's say one one percent. Because this is this is the United States it. where we're not going to make we're not going to mandate anything. We're not going to make you have health insurance because you have personal liberty. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have the, you have the right to not have health insurance. It's stupid. Okay? It's stupid. Right now, let's talk about the politics. Well, I'm sorry. Let's go back for a second. Let me just emphasize this. The bigger the insurance pool, the better. By bringing in, Danielle said this, by bringing in younger people, you lower the cost for everyone. They're covered for catastrophic coverage, but in fact, they're not going to use as much health care as they're paying for. So the sick people who need that expensive coverage get it for lower cost. Now, the politics of what happened with the Affordable Care Act was that the Obama administration originally proposed an expensive penalty. And as they got this bill put through, the cost of the penalty dropped. It dropped and it dropped. Obama was trying to be a good negotiator. Now, as a liberal, I'm angry at him because he gave away to the conservatives this penalty. Okay? thought that this was the political compromise he needed. Technically, he didn't get a single vote from the Republicans. So he gave them things and he got nothing back. The consequence of this, and this is all very active discussion right now in the United States, and I just want to take a minute and then we'll finish. The consequence is that the penalty was very small. It was just a few hundred dollars. Then more people would pay, more people would be uninsured. More people became uninsured. So what did that do to the cost of health care? Yeah. It went up because all the sick people signed up. Okay? And now you're seeing the Affordable Care Act being threatened from within because it's too expensive. Okay? And it's too expensive because the young people, young people avoided it. It's very interesting to see all this, I think. Okay? Right? And so that's one of the threats. Now, why did the Obama administration accept this, this political compromise? One, he thought he was going to get it. Two, he thought this was the beginning of health care reform. Had Hillary Clinton been elected, they would have fixed this. They would have raised the penalty. Okay? More people would have been insured, the money would have gone up, the premiums would have gone down. They made a calculation. I did a presentation 
right around the time that the Affordable Care Act was, was coming out. And I predicted that Obamacare would occur and that what would be birth would be an ugly baby. <laughs> I said it's gonna be an ugly baby, okay? Not a pretty baby, I came up with a picture of an ugly baby. It's a long okay? Ugly baby, how do you make, okay, how do you make an ugly baby? Has anyone heard of Alfred E. Newman? No. For my generation, Mad Magazine? He's a really <laughs> ugly guy, okay? He is. Huh? With the big ears. With the big ears. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the freckles, right? So I took his head and I put it on a picture of a baby, made it all yellow, and that was that. Yellow like sick. Mm -hmm. okay. Or orange. Or orange, right. Okay? So, and I said, it's going to be an ugly baby, and you're going to need health care reform. And if you look in the United States, that's really what's happening, is this reform debate is continuing. Okay? All right. Um, one hour for lunch, 20 minutes to two, we uh, come back, okay? Very good. 20 minutes to two. Yeah.